Okay, in our last session, we looked at an overview of the Acts period, just to get a bearing as to where Acts fits in the scheme and the plan and program of God. Now, in this session, we're going to just overview the book of Acts itself. Now, I just want to say again, especially for the benefit of someone who just may be watching this video without the prior one, is that we now live in a secret administration, uh, one that was never prophesied. And we are living in a period outside of all prophetic history. Israel's uh, clock has stopped, their prophetic clock. One day it will start again, but it will not start until God is finished with the uh, uh, the uh, a secret administration. During the secret administration, uh, we live without religion. We live without ritual. We live without right. Uh, we live without water baptism, without physical circumcision. We live without uh, religious feasts and suppers. We live without signs and wonders, tongues and visions, apostles, prophets, bishops, pastors, without gifts and uh, offices and assemblies. We simply live in completeness in Christ as the complement of the Christ and, uh, and we with him being the complement of God. It is a glorious place. And unless you understand the secret administration that could only take place when Israel's wall that middle wall of separation between Jew and Gentile came down, between circumcision and uncircumcision came down, between the nation Israel and uh, the nations of the world, this division came down. If you don't understand that, you'll, you can, it can wreck your life. And I know people and have talked to people whose lives have been uh, destroyed in, in many practical ways because they did not understand where they fit into God's plan and purpose. So now we're going to pick up and we're going to start. So you can just uh, if you, uh, open the scriptures with me to Acts chapter 1. And we're just going to, we're just going to go through. Now obviously uh, we're trying to keep these lessons short. Our purpose is not to do a verse by verse study of the book of Acts today. And in fact, well, we, we can uh, hardly even do a chapter by chapter description. But, but what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to overview it. You know, you, you stand back and you look over uh, this wide territory and you just, you just look at all the high points. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 1. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now, so here's what we know about the book of Acts. We know that it is written by Luke, and it is actually Luke 2. Luke 1 was his gospel, the gospel of Luke, and it starts and tells us the story of Israel's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the only writer of one of the gospels that picks up the story and carries it beyond the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and beyond his ascension and what followed. And so the, the, the Acts of the Apostles, the book of the Acts, is Luke, the book of Luke, part two. And so it just picks up the story. And so when he says, the former treaties have I made, and he's talking about the gospel of Luke, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. You see, the Gospels, the three and a half year teaching ministry of Jesus Christ was just the beginning of the, of the uh, teaching ministry of Jesus Christ uh, until the day that he was taken up. And so now he's going to begin to tell the, the rest of the story. And in verse 3 he says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and... So not only was Jesus Christ, now you got to realize, these are, these are people who knew Jesus. These are his disciples. These are the twelve. These are the disciples. These are not only the apostles, but the disciples, the seventy, and then beyond that, all those who minister with Christ. They, they, for 40, they spent 40 days after his resurrection with him. And what were they doing? Well, they were having a, 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 a seminar. Jesus was teaching them. Because what does it say? after 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Not 
of the secret administration, not of something new, but about a literal, physical, earthly kingdom that had been the subject of Israel's prophecy all the way back to Abraham. And so, uh, in fact, in Luke, you don't have to go there, but in Luke 24, 45, here's what, here's what Luke says happened with the disciples. Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. The concordance says he opened their mind so that they could understand the Scriptures. So you know what happened after? You know, there was a lot of confusion actually before that. In fact, when Jesus told Peter uh, that he was going to die, <laughs> Peter forbade it. <laughs> I'm not going to let this happen. In fact, when they came for Jesus, he, he got a sword and cut off the guy's ear, right? And because he didn't understand what was going on. But after, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, Peter and the rest of the apostles and all the disciples, they had their minds open to understand the scriptures. Now, the reason I point that out is because in verse 6, they asked Jesus a question just before he leaves. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, that's how we know what the message of the kingdom of God was that he taught them. This was a kingdom that Israel used to possess with a city Jerusalem with a throne. It was, and notice that they want to know if they're if it's this is the time he's going to restore it. Now, some people say, oh, poor, poor apostle. They had no idea that everything's getting to getting ready to change, and all these uh, promises really became spiritual. And we're spiritual Israel and all this stuff. No. These apostles had their minds open to understand the scriptures. And then you know what their next logical question was? Are you going to do this now? Is now the time that we get our nation back? You need to understand that even though there were some Jews that lived in Palestine, they had no control of their nation. It was under the Roman Empire. And they wanted to know if it was going to happen. This, Acts 1, 6, this is a key to the entire book of Acts because after their 40-day course of having their minds open to the scriptures, the next logical question was, is the kingdom coming? Now, the answer in verse 7, now we know that <laughs> this was very interesting. We can read it now in hindsight and know how wise the, the answer was to this because what was the answer going to be? Well, obviously, if, nation, if the nation of Israel had repented, then the kingdom would have been ushered in. But we know that God had a plan before Israel. Before God made his plan for Israel, he made a plan for the body of Christ, a secret administration that predates the disruption of the world. By the way, we live in a disrupted world, if you didn't know that. The whole world's disrupted. Look at, it. Look at the news. Look at your life. It's a dis everything's disturbed. And that disruption began in Genesis chapter 1. And But before God disrupted his creation, in, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth became, was, that actually, that, that Hebrew word is became, became without form and void and darkness. There was a disruption to the plan of God. But prior to that disruption, there was the plan of this age, this period that we live in, the secret administration. So if Jesus Christ had said, yes, um, it's time to start the kingdom. Well, first of all, it wasn't. <laughs> and number two, he couldn't say, no, it's not, because that would have to, he'd have to reveal a secret. So here's what he said to them in verse 7. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which God hath in his own power. He said, listen, he doesn't say, listen, you've got this all wrong. Um, you're expecting a, a literal, physical, earthly David and kingdom to come, and it's not coming. You've got the wrong hope. That's not what he said to them. So when they wanted to know, are you going to do this now? He said, I can't tell you. 
It's not, God doesn't want you to know that answer yet. And notice it says, by the way, just a little side note, it says, uh, 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 or at least the way the King James phrases it, it, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. The future restoration of Israel is going to come in times and in seasons. And uh, there's, there's much more history for humanity than, uh, excuse me, there is much more in the future of humanity on the earth than there has been in the past. We're, we're, we're all, if we had a time, if we had a time frame of, of, of here's, the, here's the beginning and, and over here's the consummation, you know, we're way back here in the timeline. You know, people think, oh, you know, we're the last days and everything's getting ready. Oh, there's a lot of God's prophecy that is still yet to be fulfilled for Israel. But right now, we're in this secret administration. Now, we want to pick up speed a little bit here. Let's go to chapter 2. Now, we're all familiar with Pentecost. This is uh, probably the most famous event in the book of Acts, is Pentecost. And it says in verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, fully come. Pentecost came every year. What is this idea that it fully came? Well, the Concordia actually gives us a really great translation of that. It says uh, that the fulfillment of the day of Pentecost came. The fulfillment. So all the feasts of the Old Testament were pictures and shadows of something that was coming ahead. And this wasn't just an annual feast that happened in Acts chapter 2. It was the fulfillment of of what Pentecost meant. Now, Pentecost was also known as the Feast of First Fruits. First Fruits. It was a celebration that the first vegetables and the first of all the crops started showing up. A little taste of some big harvest that was going to come. And so it was the Feast of First Fruits. And so what's happening here in Acts chapter 2 is the first fruit of the nation Israel's regeneration is happening at Pentecost. And so we have a sampling of a few believers. Now, you know how the story goes. There were 3,000 that believed that day. But you know what? That sounds like a lot. We say, wow, 3,000 people. Man, that was some kind of meeting. No, 3,000 people out of an entire nation that God's been dealing with for hundreds and hundreds of years and only 3,000 believe. It's just the top. It's just the start. It's just the, the first fruits. Um, in fact, James, you don't have to go there because we're gonna, we'll go to James eventually in this series. In James, he says, uh, speaking to the circumcision, that they have become a first fruit unto God. And that took place here at Pentecost. And so what happens at Pentecost, we know it. God's Spirit is poured out. Uh, tongues are being spoken and uh, uh, miraculous things are happening. Now Peter in the midst of all this, he stands up to give a message in verse 14 and Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them now what do we say? The whole book uh, the whole scripture from the call of Abraham to the end of the book of Acts is about Israel and so he says ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem uh, verse 16, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So this is a prophetic fulfillment of Pentecost. And this is recorded in Joel 2, 27. So prophecy is being fulfilled. There's no mystery here. There's no secrets here. This is, the, this is the message. You know, people say, oh, the church began at Pentecost. Hmm. I don't even know what to say about that. When you study the scriptures, you think... How, how did anyone invent that idea, and how did anyone buy that idea? Um, and then, of course, what is that prophecy? Verse uh, 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour my Spirit out upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men, these are all, all of these pronouns belong to Israel. Verse 19, And I will show wonders in the heaven above, and signs in the earth uh, beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke, 
and, uh, and, and, and you know, continuing there and all these mighty things. In verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know. Wow. Peter's not talking to any Gentiles here. Peter's talking to the nation of Israel whose Messiah came. And he came demonstrating his Messiahship. Verse 23. Now, here's what you're going to notice throughout the book of Acts in Peter's ministry. Is when Peter, Peter is going to proclaim that Jesus Christ was Israel's Messiah. And that Israel rejected him and killed him. So there's going to be a presentation of what happened at Calvary as an indictment in the divine court of law against Abraham's seed for rejecting their Messiah. Watch it happen here in verse 23. Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. He preaches what happened at Calvary as Christ, as it were, being a victim. Now, we know the sovereignty of God. Because how did the verse 23 start? Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. God's the one who did this. But you took your wicked hands and participated in rejecting and crucifying him. So Peter presents the death of Christ as not just some glorious victory, which is exclusively Paul's presentation of what happened at Calvary, but he presents it as an indictment, as a charge, a criminal charge against Israel. So then what is he? He goes on down, verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak of you, the patriarch David. And he talks about how that David, the end of verse uh, 30, that he would raise Christ to sit on his throne. David knew the Messiah would come and be raised up to sit on his throne. Verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified indictment both Lord, we don't know what a Lord is, like a landlord, Lord, the owner, the boss, the one in charge. He made, who made him Lord? God did. God hath made this same Jesus that you crucified, made him the Lord and the Christ. Christ is the, is the word for Messiah. He made him the head of and he made him the Messiah. Now notice what happens. Verse 37. Those that listened and heard what Peter said had a response. And, and here is that response. Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto the Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? What should we do about what? What should we be do about this terrible thing we have done? God sent us the Messiah and we killed him. Can you think of all the history of Israel and all the planning and purpose of the rising of Israel and the blessing of Israel and God's purpose of setting up a kingdom and God finally sends the Messiah, and they kill him. Could anything be more drastic? This is nothing about something, some new, new thing starting, the church beginning at Pentecost. This is about an indictment of Israel for their crime and sin of rejecting the Messiah. And what's, what's Peter's answer? And Peter said unto them, what's the first word? Repent. This is why, this is why, this is the message of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the message of Acts. It's a message of repentance. This is a nation who've left God. And they've got to, first of all, repent. And then what's the next thing they need to do? Be baptized. This is not my message to anybody. 
I never preached the Pentecostal message to anyone that you're responsible for the death of Christ and that I'm indicting you and that what you need to do is repent of that sin and you need to get water baptized. My message is not here at all. In fact, in fact Paul, Paul puts a word in front of grace in, in Ephesians when he finally gets to that pinnacle of revelation and he says that, that he's preaching a grace that is transcendent that is super abounding, that is limitless. Did grace used to be bound? Yeah, it did, and we, we'll, we'll see it as time would allow. And he says, and repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For what, for what reason? I have never told anybody they needed to be baptized for the remission of their sins. This is a nation that had crucified, had, had denied and crucified their apostle, excuse me, their, well actually he was their apostle. Peter says the, the, the apostle of our faith, Jesus Christ. And, and so, but he was their, their Messiah. And water baptism would remit their sins. Water baptism won't do anything for you today except get you wet. And you'd do a better job doing that in the shower. For the remission of sins. By the way, that word remission there, there's an interesting word. The concordance says, uses the word pardon. Nobody here is being justified in this passage. They're having their sins probated. Their own probation. Pardon is the probation of sin. And if so... And, and, and it's explained in Matthew chapter 8. And in fact, right here at, at the airport, uh, uh, some of our last recordings here, I taught about justification. Do you know where we are on time? Uh, you have about eight more minutes okay. before the half Just hour. Just find out where I need. I forgot to watch the clock. Uh, we're trying to keep these to a certain length. Um, so, and we talked about the the difference between forgiveness and justification. Justification is a declaration of righteousness. I don't need to be forgiven of anything. You don't need to be. We're not teaching people they need to have their sins forgiven. We're teaching people that they've been made righteous in Christ. People who are righteous don't have any, any record against them, anything to be forgiven for. And yet, in Matthew chapter 18, there's the illustration that, that, that our Savior gave of of the, the pardoning, the probationary pardon of sins that can be brought back up if you don't behave yourself and charged back. And they talked about uh, being forgiven and then they didn't turn around and forgive others and then they were arrested and put in prison. So this is a probationary pardon. So in other words, you know what? And we don't understand what probation is. Even, even in our society, this a probationary pardon is, you know what? We're going to let you out. And we're going to keep an eye on you. And if you mess up, you're going right back in the slammer. And this is God's message to Israel. Peter's message to Israel is, okay, you serious about correcting this problem of rejecting your Messiah? Then repent and get baptized so that your sins can be remitted. There will be a probationary pardon. But, and you'll see this all in the Jewish writings. In fact, people who have a difficult time, some of the most difficult passages is like Hebrews, um, chapter 6, where if you sin willfully, then there remains no more sacrifice for your sin. You know, and you can't be renewed again to repentance. Whole, that's scary stuff. But it's talking to a nation about their responsibility to God. And what's happening in the book of Acts is there's an opportunity for Israel to repent of their national sin of the rejection of Messiah and to be baptized, washing away. One place it says, washing away your sins through baptism. We'll, we'll eventually get to it in the book of Acts. Uh, the concordance says, bathing by baptism, bathing away your sins. And... But it's all on a probation, a wait and see where this is going to go. Are you going to behave yourself or not? Is this going to stick or not? 
And the story of the book of Acts is, will Israel repent nationally? And for their sin of the rejection of the Messiah, and will the kingdom enter in, or will their sins stick with them and be unpardonable? And they can't be forgiven. Wow. This is the message here. Um, I'm going to read you just a few more verses here. Um, verse 20, uh, 39. And, and for the promise is to unto you and to your children. And all that are afar off, even as many as call uh, 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 the Lord, uh, as excuse me, as the Lord our God shall call. Now, so this is talking about these promises unto you. Who? You men of Israel and your children. And those that are far off, Israel scattered among the nations now. And he says to them in verse 40, with, with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves. I have never told anybody to save themselves. But Peter's telling the nation of Israel, they have the opportunity to save themselves as a nation. And look at verse 43, and fear came upon every soul. And fear came. You'll see this all throughout the book of Acts. God starts doing something and fear comes on everyone. See, but the goal of my message today is, is the opposite of that. Is, that. is that fear will leave you, not come to you. And, um, and verse 44, And all that believe were together and had all things common. This is the, this is the faith, uh, faith of living in the coming kingdom. They lived, they lived communally, sold all their possessions, and lived communally, waiting for this kingdom to come. Verse 25, and they sold their possessions and goods. Uh, is this the start of uh, some kind of church, some kind of ecclesia? No, it's not. It is a message to a nation that's in shambles, that they have been indicted on the death of Christ and the rejection of their Messiah, and a message for them to repent. And uh, thank God our message has nothing to do with any of this. And it's all here because the wall's up. And when the wall comes down, we have this abundant grace through our Apostle Paul.